Uh, this afternoon's session is going to be looking at ways, if possible, to mitigate risk uh, and applying psychology to address the human factor. Because like the poor, the human factor is always with us. So our first speaker, Catherine Pimblett, is Senior Cyber Manager and Organisational Psychologist at AP Muller Maersk, who's going to be looking at practical, the practical management of the human component. So Catherine, over to you. Hello, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good day. Um, as as Mark, Mark said, my name is Catherine Orcat Pimblett. Um, this is my first time at Scott Secure. Delighted to be here, although slightly daunted about being in the difficult after lunch slot. So hopefully, I've, I've got enough to say here today that will keep you engaged and interested. Um, so I come here today with a very definite agenda, um, which is really to try and convince you that managing the human component of cybersecurity doesn't need to be fluffy. Um, there is a behavioral science base that we can draw upon to try and maximize our chances of success. And what I really want to do today is go through some practical use cases of where we've applied that science to deliver better outcomes. So just to start off with a little bit about me, just to hopefully convince you that I do know what I'm talking about. Um, I am currently a senior cyber manager at Mesk, the global shipping and logistics company. Um, and I head up our human factors engineering team within cybersecurity. And what we do effectively is work with our engineering colleagues to make sure we're, we're baking in people and process elements to the cyber solutions that we deliver. We also do quite a bit of work around incentivizing secure behaviors, um, but it's very much a partnership with those technical teams. I am a cognitive and organizational psychologist by training, so I'm interested both in how individuals and organizations behave. I've been with MERS two and a half years. Before that, I spent 18 years with the UK Ministry of Defense, working in both the UK and the US in a range of analytical and leadership positions, where basically the common thread was looking at how policy, people, process, and technology interact um, in shaping organizational outcomes. So all told, I've got about 20 years of experience of practically applying behavioral science. And I think what this experience has taught me is that within the cybersecurity sector, we can do better than this kind of messaging. There was some really interesting discussion this morning around humans being the source of error, and there's no doubt that they are. But I think as professionals, if our immediate stance when we're talking to colleagues is that they are a problem that we need to fix, that is not the beginning of a productive conversation. Conversely, I think recently we've had this other narrative coming in, which is that humans are actually the strongest link in the information security chain. Obviously, that's much more positive framing, but what I'd say is they can be, but it depends on how we enable them. So what I think we need to do is get a bit more granular about this conversation and look at how we can actually enable people to be part of our solution as opposed to constantly framing them as the problem. So I'm gonna start with a little bit about what we actually know about human behavior, because as I said, as psychologists by training, I know we've actually got quite a rich knowledge base out there. So to start with some really simple principles about how we see the world. Um, the point I'd make up front is that as human beings, we are not passive information consumers. And what I mean by that is that how we perceive the world is shaped as much by what's already in our heads as the information that reaches us through our senses. So it's shaped by things like our experience, the things we've seen before, our goals, what we're trying to achieve, our knowledge, our expectations, our culture, and our emotions. All of these things shape how we react to situations as much as the stimuli that we receive. And there's a shed load of studies that I could talk to you about that have evidenced this. I think that would get very dull very quickly. So rather than do that, I've got a little audience participation exercise for you. So, room full of security professionals. I'm sure you've all said this phrase. You certainly will have heard it. Security is everyone's responsibility. If you look at that graphic, can anyone see anything odd about it? Well spotted, sir. Um, that was quicker, I think, than anyone's ever got this when I've done these presentations. Um, but as, as, as the gentleman in the front said, effectively, for anyone that missed it, if you look at that triangle, it doesn't say security is everyone's responsibility. There's an extra is in there. Um, and a large proportion of people will look at that graphic and miss it. And if you're one of those people, just to reassure you, your reading comprehension is not impaired. If you had a few too many last night, this isn't it starting to kick in. 
What's, what you've just experienced is something that psychologists call top-down processing. So you were familiar with the phrase, you imposed that expectation, you matched it to a pattern in your brain, and it impacted what you physically saw. And the reason I always start by highlighting this is I think it's a really good practical example of how experience and context are key. So going back to that point about productive conversations with our colleagues, if you look at the context you have in this room, cybersecurity professionals, your job, your bread and butter is to manage cyber risk. And most, if not all of you, will have experience of quite how painful it can be when that risk comes to pass. Your average colleague just doesn't have that context. So, you know, if you're trying to get them to do their mandatory cybersecurity training and they find it dull, they don't have the context and the motivation to do it. If you're working with software developers and all of a sudden you're introducing security tooling into their pipelines, which they see as a lag on their processing, of course you're going to meet resistance. I think in cybersecurity, often we're asking people to take a personal cost for an enterprise-wide benefit that isn't always transparent to them, and that is a really hard sell. I worked with the military for a long time. If there's any environment where you could get away with saying, just do it and people will, that's probably it. And even there, it didn't work. So I think we need to be a bit smarter about this. So what do we do about it? Well, I want to walk through two very practical examples of, of where I've looked at it. And to go back to my disgruntled software engineer, I'm gonna start a little bit with this case study, which is something that my team and I've been working on over the past couple of years which is around driving the DevSecOps agenda and looking at how do we get software developers to code securely. And it comes back a little bit to um, some of the points that were made this morning about prevention rather than reaction. We know that there are a set of software vulnerabilities that hackers routinely like to exploit as businesses increasingly use software as a means of generating revenue and as we move more and more to the cloud, that attack vector is getting more and more popular. So ideally what we want to do is at the design phase of software development, make sure that we're getting rid of those vulnerabilities before they ever reach production. Sounds like an easy sell, right? Um, and I think theoretically it is, but if you're a developer in a team with tough production targets and nobody's actually mandating this or incentivizing you to do it, it's surprising to see how many companies really struggle with really engendering this cultural change. So the way we've tackled it is by applying the science. So we've used something called the theory of planned behavior, which is, as you can see from the reference, nothing new, theory from the 90s, um, but it's been well used in marketing, in public health campaigns. And what I really love about it is it's almost embarrassingly simple. So what it says is there's three factors which shape somebody's intent to perform a behavior. The first is their attitude. So in very simple terms, do I want to? Do I feel good about it? Do I feel positive about it? The second is the subjective norms around them. So is it expected? Does their boss ask them to do this? Do they see their peers doing this? And the third and final one is perceived behavioral control, which in simple terms is, can I? Do I know how to perform the behavior? Am I empowered to perform the behavior? And I understand that that probably sounds quite academic, but what's useful about this is it gives you categories of intervention. So if you want to try and shape people's attitude, what can you do? Well, you can make sure that you're doing proper outreach and partnership. You can make sure that you're reducing pain where you can. So do you understand your colleagues' workflows to be able to implement security practically? You can really look at communications around what's in it for me. So going back to the developer, rather than saying, this is about security, can you say, if you uplift your skills, this differentiates you in a crowded marketplace? There's ways we can be quite clever about it. And we can start to make it fun as well, which I know might sound like a stretch, but I'll come back to that in a moment. For as expected, this is all around leadership advocacy, recognition of good practice, security objectives, so that organizational wrapper, which is so important in terms of setting the tone from the top. And then finally, on this kind of can I piece, do people actually know what we're asking them to do? Are we setting up clear expectations of what good looks like within their particular context? Are we giving them the appropriate tools to do that? And are we actually equipping them with the skills to do it correctly? Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight with this is I think all too often when we talk about the human component of security, the answer is awareness. We'll do some awareness training. Awareness is really important, but that's only really hitting that first column. If we're making people aware that they need to do something, but they don't have the tools to do it, we're still not moving the needle any in terms of building more secure systems. 
So what we've done within MESC is, is use this as a framework to look at interventions. So we've done things like um, part with training providers to run secure coding tournaments to try and make it fun and recognize where people are really succeeding and flagging this up to their management. Like many companies, um, we set up a cybersecurity champions program, so trying to scale the impact of our um, security department out into the broader population and get their feedback in terms of how we can do better. We've put a lot of work into our policies and guidelines in terms of making sure it's really, really clear what we're asking people to do. What I noticed when I came into this role is that quite often I think we're big fans of giving developers in particular choice and flexibility. We're also giving them workload when we do that. You know, sometimes people just need to be told quite clearly, this is how you can be more secure. So that we've put a lot of work into that. And then finally, what we've done is we've developed something called the DevSecOps Culture Survey, which is not particularly clever, it's an MS Forms tool, based on these categories, it's got questions of, against them. And what that allows us to do is assess where we've got gaps. So it's quite a neat way of looking across those three categories and saying, where do we need to really uplift um, that motivating factor? Um, we've made good progress, but to be quite clear, as I said, I've, I've put the is it expected vector there as, as amber. I think that's where, as an organisation, we need to move further. I think we've got good dev engagement, but getting that business process owner um, buy-in, I think, is where we need to get to. So what's the outcome of this been? Um, well, I think what we've got is a maturing DevSecOps culture. Um, we're certainly seeing, in terms of our tooling, increased and quicker vulnerability remediation, which ultimately is the hard, um, hard metric that we want to get to. We're seeing a shrinking skills gap because we've carefully curated um, sort of training and awareness material. And what's really lovely is we're getting better cooperation. So that quote I flashed up, that was feedback that was given in the DevSecOps culture survey I mentioned last year. And that's exactly the point, really, that we want to get to, where we've got this cooperation and people feel comfortable flagging issues to security. So that's an example of where we've applied um, behavioural science to try and help people be part of the solution. What I want to cover now is how we can apply behavioural science to stop people being the problem. So case study, how do we stop people making errors that lead to cybersecurity incidents? And as I've said there, poor Kermit possibly fallen victim to a vishing scam. And there is a reason I've used a picture of a Muppet, which is probably not particularly subtle, but I'll come back to later. Um, so in terms of how we stop people making errors, Spoiler alert, we don't. Um, human error is inevitable and universal and any complex or safety critical system, they have recognized this for decades. People will slip up. Um, and focusing solely on that point of failure, I think is really unhelpful. And there's three reasons for that. First of all, it masks potential interventions. It creates a blame culture, which isn't the same as accountability and is really unhelpful. And ultimately what it does is it forces bad practice underground. So if somebody thinks they've made a mistake and feels they can't report it to the security department, that helps precisely nobody. So we really need to work on, on this kind of messaging. And the key thing I think is that we might not be able to change the human condition, but we can change the conditions in which people work. And that's what I'm gonna focus on right here. So um, again, applying the theory, this is work from a guy called James Reason, human error expert. I would heartily recommend his work to anyone who's interested in this field. But basically, he did an awful lot of work looking at aviation, at healthcare, um, and looking at places where errors can be really, really you know, impactful and critical. And what he said was that basically in any complex organization, you've got these barriers of defense. So you've got certain organizational factors, you've got supervisory or manager factors, you've got preconditions in terms of the working environment, and then you've got people that will conduct an unsafe act. You've got these barriers, but they've all got holes in them, which is why it's called the Swiss cheese model. So it's like thinking about you know, four layers of Swiss cheese. And things have to pass through those holes to get through and an unsafe act to occur, right? So um, if we look a little bit more about what these barriers mean, so organizational influences, you've got an organizational culture you've got strategic plans, you've got at a top level resource management in terms of how within your organization, certain things are prioritized. From a supervisory factor point of view, what's the adequacy of supervision and support? Is there an appropriate allocation of work? Do you have the right, the right skills in the workforce? Are you appropriating that work um, appropriately? <laughs> um, and then there's this thing around regard for rules and standards. So it's all very well at the organizational level, having these policies and rules. As somebody mentioned this morning, if they're not part and parcel of how people work, it's effectively shelfware. 
you've then got the, the actual environment in which people are working. So you might have environmental factors in terms of, is it loud? Is it busy? Is it hot? All things that might make somebody flustered and make a mistake. You've got individual factors around people's level of fatigue. Again, there was reference to that this morning in terms of incident response. You know, that level of fatigue, again, is something that might lead you to um, commit an error. And then you've got team factors. What's the team dynamic? Is everyone clear what each team member is supposed to be doing? Um, so if you've got issues each of these levels, what you can get to at this point is where somebody might make a slip. So they intend to do the right thing, but they execute the plan incorrectly. The example I always use, I was sick earlier this year, went to throw my empty paracetamol packet in the bin, walked upstairs having thrown my iPhone in the bin with an empty packet of paracetamol. So <laughs> these sorts of things happen to us all. Um, mistakes, which is where you might misdiagnose a situation, so yet you execute the plan correctly, but it was the wrong plan. And then it might also lead to violations, which is more getting into this insider threat space where people know they're doing the wrong thing, but they don't care, either because they're actively trying to cause harm, or probably more likely because it's expedient for them and nobody's, there's no consequences if, if they don't follow the rule. So those slips, mistakes and violations, they are what Reason calls active errors. And like I said, there's not a huge amount by the time you've got to that point that you can do anything about it. But we've got these things called latent errors. And that is definitely a space where we can start to intervene. So, you know, we can look at things like the organisational culture. Um, we can look at whether there's adequate supervision and support. We can look at shift patterns and see if people are being fatigued. So I might be saying that human error is inevitable, but that doesn't mean there aren't things we can put in place to manage it. And this is nothing new. Uh, this is something that they've been doing in aviation particularly for a long time. And I think we can learn a lot of this from this approach as a cybersecurity sector. Okay, so just to bring that to life a little bit, let's look back at a sort of specific cybersecurity use case. So let's imagine we're working in a company, we've got really aggressive profit targets, we've got really confusing security policies, and we've got a remote and distrusted security department. And then imagine that at a managerial level, we've got, they know that the targets are unrealistic, but they're enforced generally. There's routine disregard of security policies and standards. So then you look to teams deploying solutions, engineering teams. So perhaps we've supplied them with security dashboards, but those dashboards are actually really confusing. And it's not clear how to prioritize, say, vulnerability remediation. If there's these tough production targets, those teams are probably going to be really tired and stressed. And to go back to my earlier point, that is the ideal conditions under which somebody will make a mistake or an error. Um, and particularly going back to the sort of theory of planned behavior is it expected, but if you've got team norms in place that are supporting insecure practice, it's very difficult to get over that. It's very difficult for one person to sort of bat back against that. So what can happen? Well, I think in those, in those situations, you could easily see engineering teams, you know, making a mistake and deploying an insecure service accidentally or making a violation, thinking they've got to meet a production target they deploy it knowingly, but because the consequence of doing it isn't really transparent to them, they do it without thinking. Um, and what I'd say is to a degree, within that context and climate I've just described, that unsafe act is kind of inevitable, but that bit's avoidable. And I'd say that this is true, I'm, I'm using again an engineering example here, but you could say the same about people clicking on a phishing link, right? I think we've got to kind of get away from this focusing on the person that makes a mistake. Often they're the last person at the end of a chain. Our potential to act at that point is very limited, if not non-existent. But there's stuff we can do about this stuff. Um, and again, there's plenty of examples from other sectors of the sorts of interventions that we can take. So hopefully I'm not too over time, just got a couple of slides left. But um, what's the outcome of applying this, this sort of, of, of way of thinking and applying this lesson from other sectors? Well, I hope what the outcome is, is we stop doing this because it's not helpful. And that's not to you know, canonize human beings as being the answer to all problems, but I think demonizing them as the sole problem from the outset isn't helpful. Um, and I think we need to have a, a more sensible conversation about what our points of intervention really are. And um, so the outcome really is we can take a real holistic approach to risk mitigation, and we're drawing on best practice from other safety critical sectors. Um, 
Why this hasn't, a lot of researchers have started to talk about this more, which is fantastic to see. What surprises me slightly, it hasn't caught on to the degree it has in other sectors in cybersecurity, which is why I'll always take up an opportunity to, to talk at, um, at fora like this about where I can see the practicalities of it. Um, I think we want to get to a point where we've got accountability, but not blame. Um, having accountability, understanding where errors are occurring and looking at where the intervention points are, that's great. Pointing at that idiot over there, that's not great. That's not helpful to anybody. Um, and to further that point, I think we need to get, we need to delete the implicit Muppet. I think as a sector, we're really bad for it. That obviously the problem is people aren't clever enough and don't understand what we do. If that's the case, that's our fault. We need to get better at communicating. So just to finish off, I always think it's, it's a good idea to, to sort of finish with the so what. Um, so the key thing, Considering the human aspect of cybersecurity, it's not a dark art. It really isn't. So th think Hermione Granger, not Voldemort, for any Potterheads or parents of Potterheads. It's about learning the science. It's about looking at what's out there and looking at how we can apply it. We, we can demystify this, or, or I believe we can. Um, there's lots of fancy definitions about what human factors engineering means to me. My very simple definition is it's the structured application of empathy and common sense. Um, what I always say is this stuff isn't rocket science, but it is science. So, you know, the stuff that we can draw upon, but I think a lot of this comes back to examining ourselves and the way that we approach problems and the way we bring people with us in that, in that journey. And just to finish, again, to hammer home, there's a rich knowledge base we can draw upon. And it's only, if we do that, it's only going to increase our chances of success. So thank you very much for listening. Um, hopefully I haven't run too much over time. Perfect, and I'll look forward to taking any questions later. Always a pleasure to engage on this stuff, so thank you. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, as I said, there will be a chance to ask questions later. Uh, not quite yet, sir, not quite yet, but... Um, our next speaker is Andy Smith, Principal Security Architect for BP. And what Andy wants to look at is how do we ensure that the AI we use in future is A-OK? -okay? So, Andy, over to you. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here this afternoon. Thank you for coming along and listening to me uh, ramble on about how we can secure uh, AI. Uh, unless you've been, well, even if you have been living under a rock for the past year and a half, you would have definitely heard of this thing called AI, right? You can't go uh, anywhere without seeing AI being the solution to all of your problems. Uh, we've uh, heard it in a number of talks today. Uh, no doubt you've been speaking to some of the uh, vendors upstairs today, uh, everyone's got an AI solution uh, that they want to sell you. So in this session, we're going to look a little bit about, okay, well, how do we make sure that the AI solutions that our, our businesses are leveraging are actually going to be safe and secure? I just want to call out, okay, AI is a broad topic. Uh, there's different flavors of AI. I guess I'm going to be focusing here very much on those large language models, the, the generative AI that seems to be the big buzzword nowadays. Uh, a little bit about myself before we kick start. Uh, so yeah, Andy Smith, I'm a principal security architect at BP, uh, where a big part of my role is looking at how we secure the emerging technologies. So again, all those buzzword technologies that uh, folks in our uh, digital and business teams get really excited about adopting, uh, but we don't necessarily have an easy way just to uh, Google, how do I secure this new thing? Okay. Part of my role is how do we build out uh, that guidance? How do we enable our businesses to adopt these new novel technologies in an as safe and as secure way as possible? Uh, I also teach for SANS. Uh, I'm an instructor for the uh, SEC 530 course. That's all around uh, defensible security architecture and engineering. And uh, where I have time in between those two things, uh, I uh, volunteer my time for the OWASP Foundation. Uh, so for the past uh, nine months or so, uh, I've been working as one of the core team members uh, on the OWASP Top 10 for Large Language Models project. So I guess most folks are probably fairly familiar with OWASP and the, the classic top 10 of uh, the 10 most common web security vulnerabilities. Well, the top 10 for LLMs project has done exactly the same thing, but focusing in on those vulnerabilities that are specific to LLM-based applications. 
I'm going to touch on that a little more uh, later on. When we combine the words AI and security, we might be referring to a number of different things. So just to level set here, I am not going to be talking about how we in cybersecurity can use AI to solve our cybersecurity challenges and problems. Uh, we've heard a number of speakers talk about that already today. I'm also not going to be talking about how attackers use AI systems in order to try and attack our organizations. Again, we've heard a bit more about that uh, earlier today. Uh, my focus here is very much on those uh, AI solutions that our business want to use. How do we make sure that those are appropriately safe and secure? Because we have some fairly unique and fairly novel security challenges associated uh, with AI and particularly uh, with large language model based based solutions. When it comes to trying to understand a new technology and to build out some security guidance around that technology, one of the, the, the models, one of the frameworks that I tend to apply is to try and peel away some of the layers of technology and to really understand how is that technology working? What's happening under the hood? I find that always enables me to have a much better understanding of then what are the security challenges and how do we address them. And AI is no different. AI is one of those things that, again, if you chat to uh, particular, particularly vendors, uh, it's almost like magic, right? It, it's like this magic fairy dust that we sprinkle on a product and suddenly it solves all of the problems. Uh, that's unfortunately not the case, right? AI is not magic. Uh, it is just maths at the end of the day. So uh, if we're going to explore some of those security challenges with large language models, uh, let's start off here by uh, peeling away a couple of those layers of technology. Where do our large language models actually come from? Well, a whole bunch of training. Uh, so we're talking about language models here. Therefore, uh, the data that is used to train language models is human language. So typically, a bunch of information scraped off of the internet of conversations, of uh, people asking questions and people answering those questions, uh, news articles, uh, documentation, any ki kind of human language. All that data gets thrown at millions of dollars worth of GPUs, and out the other end comes a language model. Now, OK, the reality is there's a, a little bit more to it than that. I've oversimplified a little bit. But for our purposes here, OK, that's, that's a good baseline uh, start. So we have our large language model, and we can then start to use that for various purposes. And one of the most common uh, uses of a language model is to perform completions, which is essentially where we are providing some text to a language model and asking it to tell us what's the next most likely word to appear after this. So, for example, we may take a, a language model and we may feed it uh, the text, uh, some people like to put pineapple on there, Language model thinks about this for a little while and probably is going to spit out the word pizza because some strange people do indeed like to put pineapple on their pizza. Uh, but that's not the only thing that a large language model might respond with because some people like to put pineapple on their, uh, on their, on their plate, uh, maybe on their yogurt, on their breakfast. There's many words that could finish that sentence. And so what exists within that large language model is effectively a, a probability distribution where the most likely responses are the ones that are most likely to be returned by that language model. I call out that probability distribution uh, because that uh, drives a degree of uncertainty around language models. And we're going to come back to that uncertainty and what that means for security uh, in a moment. I also want to call out here, um, this is what's happening inside a language model at the most fundamental level. So when you are looking at all of those wonderful AI-powered solutions, particularly the, the generative AI, the LLM-powered solutions, this is what's happening under the hood. 
doesn't sound very impressive, right? Oh, it's just guessing the next word. How do we get all this amazing functionality that we see in products, that we see in things like uh, ChatGPT, from a system that is essentially just guessing the next most likely word to appear uh, in a sentence? All of that comes from all of the other things that uh, sit around that LLM, that large language model. Uh, an application that is brokering uh, input and output to and from the users of that system. Typically, that uh, application will be uh, taking user input and inserting that inside some kind of system prompt. A uh, system prompt being a set of instructions that get supplied to that large language model in order to try and drive its behavior into a certain direction. And so for something like ChatGPT, the system prompt goes along the lines of, uh, you are ChatGPT, you are a helpful AI assistant, you're here to answer a user's query in an informative and courteous way. Uh, the user's query is, and then the application pastes in the, the question that a user has asked. Uh, the system prompt continues, and your response is dot, dot, dot. All of that gets sent to a language model, and that language model then starts answering that question. So that system prompt is the thing that is uh, driving the LLM to try and actually answer the question at hand. Depending on the LLM app, there may also be other things that help uh, drive some additional grounding to, to steer a language model into providing more useful answers. Uh, things like uh, a vector database of embeddings, essentially a, a bunch of extra information, specific facts, uh, specific statements that we are supplying to that LLM to say, please only use uh, these particular bits of information to answer a question, not just the random stuff that you learnt in the training process off the internet, because we know that shock horror, the internet isn't always completely correct. Uh, we also see LLM-based apps integrating with other systems through things like plugins and tools. This is where our LLM app is uh, looking at the outputs from an LLM and determining, do I need to do something else? Is there another tool that I need to run in order to add information to then feed back to an LLM? Okay, so hopefully we've got a good idea now of kind of really what's happening under the hood uh, so we can start to think about the particular security challenges associated with LLM-powered apps. One of the things uh, on, on this slide just particularly want to call out here uh, is that the instructions on what we are asking an LLM to do uh, is written in human language. Those instructions are also, also intermixed with some of the data that our user has provided in terms of their query. And the combination of uh, the, uh, the interaction with our LLMs being in human language rather than computer language uh, is that, okay, it's easier to have misunderstandings. Human language is, is complex, right? We have lots of different words that kind of mean a similar thing. And I'm sure everyone's been in a conversation before uh, with someone and, you know, the, the other person has misinterpreted what you said, right? And you've had to kind of restate the same thing again, but in a, a slightly different way. Our human language is, is difficult to understand. And it leads to uh, some really interesting unintended failures when we start to feed human language into a large language model. Human language is also far easier to manipulate because of the you know, huge amount of different ways that you can effectively say the same thing. Again, if you've ever turned on the news to listen to a politician, you know how easy it is for language to be morphed and twisted uh, to answer a question without actually answering a question. Likewise, it's very easy for attackers to uh, twist and change um, inputs into an LLM-powered application to drive that app into doing things that it was not intended to do. Uh, this is what we refer to as prompt injection, where attacker is uh, causing those intentional failures within an LLM-powered app. And we've seen a bunch of examples of this. Um, a couple of recently, the, uh, the Chrysler car company had a nice AI-powered uh, chatbot on their website to help answer queries from customers. And it uh, didn't take long for one customer to work out that it could uh, convince this chatbot 
to agree to sell him a car for a dollar because of you know, manipulating some of those prompts. Another example, I think the DPD, the delivery company, uh, they had uh, someone that was able to, to get their chatbot to then start swearing up them and do all sorts of other horrible things. Um, prompt injections are a whole a big um, range of, of different vulnerabilities wrapped up in prompt injections. I could talk for hours on that stuff, but uh, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges we have with LLM-powered apps. AI systems, LLM-powered systems, uh, also are non-deterministic. This is very different to the way that we are used to computers operating. We're used to the fact that if you uh, run the same piece of code multiple times, you're going to get the same result. LLM-powered systems, that's not the case. There's intentionally some randomization built into that large language model in order to bring a bit of creativity to answers. Creativity is, is a good thing, but it means that the operation of a large language model now becomes unpredictable. We, it becomes uh, undeterministic. We're never quite sure how it's going to answer. And again, from a security perspective, that's, that's a bit weird, right? That's, that doesn't give us much confidence that a system is going to be operating reliably. There's a number of ways that we can reduce things like prompt injection. Uh, we can uh, reduce uh, um, hallucinations of LLM-based systems, uh, but there's always a trade-off here in terms of the more uh, grounded that we try and make answers, the more uh, filtering that we might put in place on inputs and outputs, uh, the, uh, the more we are going to impact the, the creativity and usability of an LLM-powered system. So there's a, a, a really big trade-off between uh, security and reliability, uh, along with accuracy and uh, utility as well. All of these things are uh, really closely intertwined. Uh, the last point I'm going to call it here, the last thing that's kind of a bit special about LLM-powered systems is just the vastness of the problem space. Again, with a traditional piece of code, in order to make sure that it's going to operate reliably, to gain some confidence that uh, we don't have any security bugs, we perform a bunch of testing, right? We test all of the inputs and verify what the outputs are. Well, we don't have the ability to do that with AI systems. After all, we use AI not because it sounds cool, but because our puny human brains can't actually work out how we would manually code something in order to solve a problem. So we ask the computer to learn how to do it itself. There's no way that we can then verify all those potential inputs and outputs because there's so many inputs and so many possible outputs. If we did try to test each and every one, well, we'd probably hit the inevitable heat death of the universe before we finish that task. So a whole bunch of challenges uh, that are very, very specific to LLM-powered systems that make them somewhat different to our traditional IT systems, and therefore we need to think about slightly different approaches to when it comes to testing and securing those systems. And if that didn't, wasn't enough complexity, right, there's additional complexity in the form of, okay, well, how are AI systems being delivered to us in our organizations? Are we buying a product that is uh, AI-powered? Or conversely, do we already have a product in our inventory where the vendor has now just released some extra AI features, oh, and they're turned on by default and we don't have a way of turning them off, thanks vendor. Or potentially uh, in your organizations, you may have uh, teams that are trying to build their own LLM-powered apps. How we treat each of those different cases will vary somewhat because we're accountable for different elements uh, of those solutions. It's a little bit like having a shared responsibility model for, for cloud infrastructure, right? You can kind of think of it in a similar way. Uh, the, the framework that uh, I tend to use or that uh, the, the way I think about it in my head um, is of a number of different uh, security scopes or, or layers. 
Yes, there's definitely, certainly that training aspect, right? That process of taking a whole bunch of data and creating a model out of it. And most of the time, we're not going to be doing that in our organizations uh, because, okay, that's a really intensive and expensive process. We're probably going to be leveraging somebody else's model. Uh, for example, things like a GPT 3.5, a GTP, GPT 4, uh, maybe something like Llama, those sort of, sort of models that somebody else have created. There's the, the, the model itself, uh, or potentially a fine-tuned model, if, if we've decided to go through that fine-tuning process. In some cases, models may be accessed or interfaced via a platform. Uh, now, this may be a cloud platform or something that, again, you're developing in-house to kind of broker access to different models. That can actually be a really great place to embed some common security controls that apply across multiple different applications or use cases. I mentioned previously that a lot of the power around uh, an LLM solution comes in that app, the thing that is wrapped around uh, the LLM itself, uh, the code, uh, the uh, embeddings, the grounding, uh, all of those sorts of things inside that uh, application. And again, there's a bunch of things that we need to be thinking about in order to secure that app. And I call out here uh, the, the OWASP uh, top 10 for LLMs, uh, a great resource. I'll touch a little bit more on that. I have a, a, a separate frame of a, a use case that's separate to an application uh, because how we use an application has an impact on uh, what is the, the severity if something goes wrong. You know, we could use the same application in multiple places and uh, in use case A, well, maybe you know, it's for um, creating some ideas for team building exercises. Okay, that's, that's nothing particularly sensitive, right? That doesn't involve our company information. Okay, what could go wrong? Yeah, go ahead, uh, use something like ChatGPT for, for uh, creating ideas for team building. Uh, conversely, using that exact same application, in this case, ChatGPT, for uh, analyzing the uh, sensitive terms of our contracts. Okay, well, maybe the, the impact of something going wrong there is, is much more significant. So really important to think about the differences in use cases. And then, of course, we've got the, the broader organization, the, the broader society, uh, the sorts of impacts uh, of uh, long-term use of uh, AI and LLM-powered systems that we may want to think about. Now, I call out here that um, not all of these uh, kind of layers will be directly applicable to you. Again, you know, you're not necessarily always going to be the one training a model, but at some point, there is a model there. This is going to be something that's indirectly related to you, and you're going to be wanting to ask your suppliers, your vendors, about how did you train your model? What data did you train your model on? Um, and particularly if you're then doing fine tuning, okay, how is that protected? And so on and so on. Got to call out a couple of resources here uh, that are super useful, uh, super valuable. Uh, the first one, that uh, LLM uh, top 10. Um, if you, well, I strongly recommend you check this out uh, at llmtop10.com. Uh, the 10 most common uh, LLM related application vulnerabilities. There is a whole host of information uh, that the, the OWASP team here uh, have built out. Uh, I've got to say, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to work with uh, some really, really smart people in this space to, to build out this guidance. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff there in terms of not only what these vulnerabilities are, uh, but how you can go about mitigating them in your applications. Uh, this is something that's very, very specific to uh, teams and individuals that are building those LLM-powered apps themselves. Uh, what about folks that maybe sit more at a, a management tier? Uh, maybe you're, you're looking at more of a governance layer. Uh, well, hey, we got you covered there as well. Uh, so there is a really awesome checklist uh, around uh, cybersecurity and governance, also published uh, by OWASP. Uh, just Google for LLM governance checklist and it'll pop up. Uh, this doesn't necessarily give you all the answers, but it is a really, really great list of things. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Do you have this in place? So if your role is a little bit more of a you know, managerial or governance role, this is probably a good resource to, uh, to be taken a look at. 
Final thing as I wrap up here. Uh, some top tips that I found uh, from my experiences uh, trying to secure LLM-based apps uh, within my organization. Uh, first of all, uh, try to avoid saying no. You know, cybersecurity teams have a bit of a bad rep for being the department of no, right? Uh, there's the old joke of, you know, if you ask a five different cybersecurity people a question, you're going to get seven different versions of no. This is not a good place to be in, right? We all see a groundswell of desire to use these AI-powered apps. The hype is almost unbearable, right? I'm sure many of you have experienced pressures in your organizations of, now we need to use this AI thing. Our competitors are, and we don't want to fall behind. We really need to do this. So try to say yes as much as possible. A big benefit of saying yes as much as possible is that those business teams then get the opportunity to see the AI for themselves. And surprise, surprise, shock, horror, some of the claims being made by vendors are not always true, right? And so this can be a great way of then uh, removing some of the tension if our businesses are, are looking at AI-powered solutions and then they realize, oh, this is not actually going to change the world for us. Okay, it's, it's releasing some of the pressure on us in security. Clearly, you need to balance risk here. Uh, so think about the potential impact if something goes wrong. Uh, what is the attack surface? Uh, any LLM-based system that is open to the public, okay, the default probably should be no until you've had a very, very close look at it uh, based on some of the uh, case studies I mentioned earlier. Second top tip, uh, find some allies. It's not just us in security that have concerns around uh, LLMs and LLM-based apps. Real challenges in legal, in procurement, within teams looking at uh, digital ethics and responsible AI. There's a number of individuals across uh, your organizations that will be uncomfortable about AI and want to have some checks and balances in place. So, look for those allies to help you. Uh, there was a, a question this morning um, that, that came up around the uh, EU AI Act. Yep, that's just come in, right? Uh, that's a law, you must adhere to the law. So, okay, maybe go and have a chat with your legal team about how you can get together, maybe implement some governance processes to make sure that, again, the AI apps that you folks are uh, deploying in your organizations are not only secure, but also legal as well. And lastly, uh, upskill and contribute. There are very, very few experts in AI security. Uh, it's something that collectively, as an industry, we're still working out. Uh, so don't worry that you don't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. Uh, but look to upskill where you can. Uh, Play around with creating your own LLM-powered apps. Uh, jump onto something like uh, the, the Langchain website. Langchain, a great Python library. You can just copy and paste, I think, like 20 lines of code, and you create your own chat GPT-like system. It's a really great way of getting some hands-on experience of how things are working under the hood. Uh, play around with things like Gandalf. If I don't know if anyone has seen the, the Gandalf little game of how you can use prompt injection. If you haven't, definitely give it a go. And yes, contribute to some of those uh, public uh, activities. Things like uh, the OWASP projects, uh, things like um, uh, the, a whole bunch of other you know, public bodies are, are getting uh, groups together to try and uh, work out some of the problems that come with AI security. So take part in those, great way to uh, work with peers, learn off of peers, and, and help kind of give back as well. So, uh, that's me. Um, I think we're about to jump into some Q&A. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to invite to the stage now Dave McKenzie and Holly Foxcroft. Everybody in the room will have seen a one or other of these, but it's possible that you might not have seen both. So I'm just going to ask them to very briefly introduce themselves, just give a wee bit of background. So, Holly, do you want to kick off? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Holly Foxcroft. 
Um, so I'm Head of Neurodiversity and Cyber Research and Neurodiversity Consulting. Oli, could I get you to pull that microphone towards you? I think it's, it's, it's having to overwork. There you go. Hello. <laughs> there we go. Shall I start from the top? Um, so, yes, Holly Foxcroft. I'm Head of Neurodiversity in Cyber Research and uh, Head of Consulting at Stotterme Consulting. So I further my already standing research into neurodiversity within cybersecurity. Um, previously, it was more on the cybercrime side and understanding the vulnerability of neurodiversity, which can contribute to pathways into cybercrime itself. Now I'm looking at um, neurodiversity's impact into cybersecurity posture. And I support organizations who want to be more neuroinclusive, how to engage with a more neurodivergent workforce, and to, of course, already support the very neurodiverse teams that we already have. Thank you very much. Dave. I'm Dave, I do blue teams. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm Dave McKenzie. Uh, I yeah I do, I do I do I build blue stuff for a living. So uh, I currently run my own consultancy, Damn Good Security, uh, and we help small, medium-sized businesses with cybersecurity problems, like how to build strategies, how to deal with supply chain issues that you're now getting as a small business. Okay. As with this morning, there's two ways of asking questions. You can either do it in Slido. Um, or you can stick your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. And before we go to Slido, has anybody got a question from the floor? Right to the front here. Do that, we'll come back to you in a moment. Thank you. If you could identify yourself as well, please, sir. Yeah, um, Craig Ramsey from Omada Identity. So it's for Catherine, but then anyone wants to add as well. But you, the example you gave about bringing the organization along with you and enabling them to understand cyber security better. If you were to flip that on the head of us trying to have that conversation upward in organizations, I think often we can all be guilty of talking about it very much as a technical problem yeah. and not aligning it that cyber risk is business risk. Is there any tools or techniques that you've found effective in communicating that and helping them well, not understand, they're not stupid people, um, but understanding the importance and helping us gain the investment in what is meant to be a priority that we keep hearing? No, absolutely. And I think it's a really great point. I think that is where we trip ourselves up a lot. And interestingly, I saw quite a similar thing when I worked with the military, when we were looking at people trying to get investment in communications technology versus tanks and ships. Uh, you know, how do you really get that benefit across? Was well, it something that feels quite techy? I think the best thing we can do is really tie the capabilities we offer to clear business outcomes. And it sounds like a really obvious thing to do, and it, be, it can become quite difficult. But I think having a clear narrative around addressing this risk allows us to perform better in ways X, Y, and Z. Um, the risk reduction narrative is a really important one, but I think a lot of the time, it's just a bit behind me. <laughs> but whoever asked the question, Pub, yes, absolutely. Um, it, you know, I think the risk reduction conversation is a very important one, but ultimately I think a lot of boards are concerned about their bottom line. So if there's some way to frame um, cybersecurity within that context, I think that's the best hope we've got of communicating at that level. I hope that answers the question. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I always ask an organisation, what does a bad day look like for you? Uh, and sometimes you get a blank look and you go, okay, we've got some work to do here. But if the business doesn't know what bad day looks like, mm. I've just taken away all your computers, how does that, how does, how does your day look like now? Uh, and that's, I always start there. And if, if nobody's answered that question, uh, that's the first place to start because then you can talk to the business about this is the impact that removing of X system or X capability happens. It will be, for those that were in my talk earlier, it will be three days before we stop taking orders because of this. And being able to translate it back into the business processes uh, don't, it's not a cyber conversation, it's a business conversation. It always has to be the, this process here stops working. We can either invest in cyber to make it resilient, or we have to have backup processes which will cost X, Y, and Z. And sometimes cyber security is not the answer. Sometimes it's the buy another one, so you've got two. Okay, thank you. Lady there. Another cat. Another question for Ka uh, Catherine. My name is Dr. Catherine Mongol. I'm a, also a behavioral scientist with a history of working 
um, in the IT sector Fantastic. and the civil engineering sector. So um, my question is, how do you convince the management of your company about the theory of planned behavior as a basis for um, the processes that you're trying to show? Do you have other psychologists there that can kind of ratify what you're saying? Or is there someone that just believes that you're an expert because you, you have the qualification? How do you convince them that you've got the right tools and what you're saying is appropriate? It's, it's a really good question because, as you'll know, coming from a similar background, there's not that many of us. So it's quite easy, I think, to get away with just stating things and that then becoming the default truth. Um, within the organization, there's it, it's me and my team. So within the organization, I don't have that level of challenge. But what I'm really big into is peer review across the broader community. So I think it's getting out there and coming to events like this and getting input from people like yourselves to say, right, well, this has got this downsize. I think with any application of any theory, it's not going to be perfect, right? And taking the theory of planned behavior as an example, there are detractors, there are issues with it. There are things about, is this just creating, you know, inclined abstainers is actually prompting the action that you need. I don't think there's ever going to be a silver bullet. What we found is that this probably, because it's so simple, is a fairly useful framework, which we've seen succeed in other sectors that we can use as a first check to look at our interventions. Will that develop further? I, I certainly hope so. But I think peer review is massively important and it's very nice to meet you as someone else working in the industry. <laughs> I'm gonna ask this question off Slido because it just made me smile. Um, I'm all for being positive, but what if a lot of people in your business are Muppets? How do we mitigate that risk? Andy. You've got to make security easy, right? Um, if, if you believe that there are a lot of quote Muppets in your organization, uh, you've got to make it you know, really difficult for them to do something undesirable. Uh, you've, you know, you, you've got to be user centric, right? Uh, one of the, the, the mindsets that uh, we, we adopt in, in BP is make security easy, make security the easiest path to follow so that you actively need to do something negative or bad in order to be insecure. Now, again, it, it's kind of easy to say that, and the, the practice is, is a little more challenging. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's my take on it. Holly? Is Muppet a Scottish word, or is it generally those like Kermit the Frogs? Or are we talking about just people being? Uh, yeah, I'm related to Wolverton. Yeah, OK, right, got it. it. Used in Scottish vernacular, <laughs> but I don't think we originated it. <laughs> He's come with a frog and yes. his piggy. Okay, um, one thing I think we should address is the accessibility of your security training as well. And there's, there's an organization called Culture Gem, um, and it actually addresses the accessibility of your security awareness training um, and how you are reaching the wider organization outside of your cybersecurity team to drive home um, how to approach cybersecurity awareness training. Um, and accessibility, I think, is, is one key point to actually make sure you're meeting them where they are in their understanding. What language are, uh, do they understand? And then, of course, measuring. Measuring if they are taking that on board or where those pitfalls are. So just going to sing from the top of my voice again, Culture Gem. Please write it down. Please look at the work that they do. Um, and hopefully Gemma, who runs Culture Gem, will pat me on the back again. She's a great girl. <laughs> I'm going to quote something back to you, Catherine. Um, you, one of your slides, you said, human error is inevitable. And I'd like everybody to have a say on this, if it's, if it's OK with them. Um, if human error is inevitable, surely, logically, we're better without the humans. I'd very much like to answer that, but I'll let my panel members <laughs> go first. <laughs> One at a time, please. One at a time. I guess, well, what's the alternative? Uh, is the suggestion there, I'll replace everything with, with AIs, or...? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't think we can remove humans at all. Um, yes, people make mistakes, but so do systems, right? When we look at uh, AI reliability, um, okay, it produces good answers most of the time and absolutely crazy answers other times, right? Um, we, we almost have a, a higher expectation of AI than we do of, of people, right? You know, we accept that, that people are going to make mistakes but maybe uh, have, have no exception of uh, an AI or a computer making a mistake. We expect it to be, be perfect. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we can remove people. I don't think we should remove people. 
Um, <laughs> I think that people are a source of error and that error needs to be managed, which is why I'm never a fan of this. People are the strongest link in security because you're always going to find an example probably quite quickly of where that was not the case. The analogy I draw is with aviation. Um, so people are a source of error. They're also a source of incredible creativity. And the example I tend to fall back on was um, a United Airlines flight where in, sort of in the States back in the 80s, um, one of the tail mounted engines exploded, cut all hydraulic power. That plane should have crashed. No one should have survived that. The air crew on board, having lost all their engineering potential and, and, and instrumentation to actually steer the plane, actually used the throttles to control power to the engines and got that plane on the ground. Now, people died, but a lot of people survived. And had that plane been controlled purely by algorithms that don't have that capacity for creativity, and someone might fight me on that, but I'd fight them back, um, I would argue that that plane, would, those people would not have survived. So I think we really need to sort of take the rough with the smooth when it comes to people and systems. They add a great deal. They are also a source of error. So I think it's, to, to, to Andy's point, how do we maximize the potential and mitigate the issues? I think that's the balance. And it's not an easy one to strike, but like I said, I think we do have tools and expertise at our disposal where we can do it. Okay, Holly, bin the humans. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you're a divergent, so sometimes I actually ask myself that quite a few times. Um, <laughs> I think there is there is so much power in diversity of thought. There is so much power that, that we have got as far as we have because of that. And what we do now is we live to neuronormative standards, which is mainly neurotypical. We only accept those ways. And that's why we fall short in so many different ways. We, we don't accept different ways of thinking. We don't accept different ways of learning. We accept that they exist but we don't allow them to happen. And we don't make different, we don't make level platforms for that to happen. And anything that does, we just outcast. And we say that's, that's not the right way. We need to be more wider in accepting that we are different and there are gonna be differences and there are gonna be shortfalls and it's meeting people where they are, expect, except expecting everyone else to just be at this one level playing field. So don't bin the humans but except some of them may already be in the bin, maybe pull them out of the bin by giving them the right support. <laughs> Excellent. Dave? Uh, I, there are many humans in my past that I wish we could have put in the bin. Uh, but I, I, I've, I've always been... I mean, you take fishing and you go, right, that, that Muppet clicked on a fishing link. <laughs> uh, no, that person clicked on a fishing link and something happened and anybody can click on it. So human error, yes, is completely inevitable. It's our job to make the fact that that error should not allow a network or a business to be brought down to its knees. So if your business can be brought to its knees by someone clicking on a single link, there's something wrong in your security department. Now, it's not an easy thing to fix by any means, and there's a lot of work for a lot of people, but the only way you're gonna make phishing go away is by removing the ability for a single person in the office to bring down the entire network by clicking on a link. And if you want to follow all the way through, nobody should be able to impact the organization by a single action. Can I just add another point? Um, so I'm also the cyber security lead for the Portsmouth Education Partnership. Um, and Portsmouth, way, way down south, um, we are a city where a lot of our children live in deprivation and we are using um, a digital drive to support um, our schools and our, our children. Um, and I'm leading on the cyber security, both advising schools on what they definitely need to do, training they need to give, but also supporting children in digital citizenship. And what we have seen with some research with the University of Portsmouth is risk assessment. Now, years 9, 10 and 11, um, what's it in Scotland? Like just towards the end of high school, yeah. I'm not sure in your school structure. Fifth and sixth. They, they mostly up to a 90, 9, 87 to 93% pass phishing simulations. What they fall foul to is dis and misinformation online. So I think over the next few years, we're gonna to start to see as Gen Z now come into our workforce, is that difference in risk and the difference in perception of risk. Um, but also the way that they understand phishing is they are so susceptible. They, they, they will, if they receive an email, they will absolutely analyze it completely. Oh, I'm not clicking on that. It's almost been built in them. So I think it's generational as well. 
So how we approach so, um, security training, I think it's actually going to change as we start to welcome a younger workforce in. I think you're going to need to change. Are they then going to be more open to actual social engineering tactics because of the dismiss information? So I think that's actually something that we need to have a wider look at as well. OK. Can I just please bear with me on this? Because that was a lovely story about the aeroplane. I'm going to tell you another one. Again, absolutely true story. Um, it was a, a United Airlines flight, um, and they lost everything. And the pilot was coming down basically in a 100-ton glider full of passengers. And that airport was too close, and that one was too far away. So he needed to lose height very, very rapidly. And as it transpired, he'd learned to fly as a glider pilot. So he did with this aircraft what you would do with a glider. He turned it on its side. And the, there's no lift under the circumstances. You just drop straight out of the sky. Uh, and I saw an interview with the passengers who said, we were looking down at the guys on the 14th tee of the golf course, and they were looking up at us. And they then found some guys on the 14th tee of the golf course and said, we could see faces in the windows. And at the last second, he flipped it out and landed it on the runway. Now, they all survived, great story, blah, blah, blah. Again, comes back to your business. Had it been fly-by-wire, had it been computer-generated, could it have done it? Don't know. But the fact is they have simulated that incident, that flight, in flight simulators time after time after time, and no one has ever managed to do it again. So it goes back to the business. There is definitely room for humans somewhere. Question here. This is anonymous. Behavioral change. Are there different approaches for different audiences? And this is, the, this is the kicker. What if senior execs are consistently engaging with phishing emails? And I'm sure that never happens. <laughs> Who wants to take it? Talk money, because that will make them listen. <laughs> Um, you have to meet what, so for what reason are they clicking on, on that link? Um, you probably aren't going to change that because it may be their job to open links. It may be their job to open invoices. So talk to them about what to do should they click a link if it has opened up and it is malicious. Do they know exactly what to do then? But also talk money. Show them how much it would cost them in, in clear context and put it on paper. Put it in an Excel spreadsheet because that's what they like to hear. Think of what their role is and then deliver the information they need in the context that's preference to them. Trust me, then you'll start to see that they start to listen. Meeting people where they are. I'd maybe add, you know, in terms of um, different people learning in different ways about the, the threats and, and what they should and should not be doing, um, making things relevant to an individual's day job is absolutely key as well. Uh, so again, in, in BP, we have uh, some employees that are working in an office. We've got some employees that are working uh, out in the field. You know, their, their job is to climb up uh, wind turbines. Uh, we've got other employees who work um, or in fuel stations as you know, customer service. Uh, we have a very diverse range of employees doing a diverse range of roles. And repeating the same tired message that only really applies if you work in an office doesn't necessarily work for the whole variety of individuals. So uh, we've, uh, yeah, a lot of our awareness campaigns and, and education campaigns are now becoming quite role specific. So we're gonna have a different set of messaging and awareness for the folks that are working in a, uh, say a fuel station as to those that are uh, climbing up a, a wind turbine versus all the other different roles that we have really makes it real, makes it, makes it um, yeah, just a, a, a lot better response rate in terms of that messaging. Definitely. We, we have a very similar challenge within MESC that, you know, you're covering everything from senior executives through to seafarers to people who are working, developing applications. So like Andy said, it's a very broad church. So I think tailoring that messaging is really important. I think the other key with this is that I remember someone who once mentored me said that probably one of the most important phases when you're solving any complex problem is problem formulation. And it's actually the bit where often we spend the least amount of time. So why is that happening? 
why are those those senior executives behaving in that way? To, to Holly's point, is it just part and parcel of their role? And that really should help guide the solution because I think it's your point Dave made earlier, the solution might not be training and awareness. It might be that actually within the context of that role, that person is likely to continue making that error. So what other stop gaps can we put in place? And that's why I think it's really important to have this multidisciplinary approach where you're bringing people with different types of expertise to the table from the beginning of trying to understand the problem to really understand what your freedom of maneuver is to change it. Um, so that, I think that would be the only thing I'd add. Anything to add, Dave? One innovative solution to this problem is to have the PA print out all his emails and bring them in in order. I once had to urgently fix a printer because apparently he couldn't read his emails. And I thought, this is very strange. Why would you need to fix a printer to, so that he can read his emails? Turns out his PA prints all his emails and takes them in, in order, and he reads them on paper because he does not believe in computers. I'm like, great. But yeah, I mean, you have to ultimately just make it so that nothing they click on can do damage. Uh, and if, if that doesn't work, then tell them they're going to have to go and buy another mail filtering solution that will be about 400 grand a year or stop clicking on the links. It's not just links either. And I think, mm. I think this is a perfect example. And it's like kind of the evolution of it's just making things easier, making things quicker, anything that makes our job or getting information quicker. Perfect example is, is above my head and down there is that QR code. Um, so in Portsmouth, we've got an absolute every on nearly every Ringo machine. We've got fake QR codes. It's, it's someone in the city, and um, we have linked it to a college, actually. Um, a very rich student in Portsmouth, let's put it that way. However, it's meeting how people just find things easy. Now, we can promote don't click on links. And if we had a link that was sent out to you, how many of you would click on that? But how many of you have been scanning those QR codes? It's about supporting your browser, and it's supporting those types of evolving. And it's how does it make it easy? Because a lot of security um, awareness in, in don't do this, don't do this, check that, check this. It's not easy. It's, it's quicker just to click it and then yeah. report it. So secure it at the site, secure your browsers because people are going to click links, people are going to scan those QR codes, and it's just the evolution in how we are with our relationship with technology and cyberspace itself. And don't make people feel stupid. Yeah. Um, there was a vendor here... Uh, well, not actually. The, I don't think it was a digit conference. It was one I did quite a few years ago on cybersecurity, and one of the vendors turned up, and they were giving away those little pen drives. And um, stood up to speak in the afternoon and said, uh, "I hope you hope you'll plug them in and what have you, because it's got it's got a fun little virus on it." I have never seen a room go so cold so quick. <laughs> you know, I don't think that company's in business anymore. It's just don't make people feel like fools. They'll come along with you if you explain it, but if you make them look stupid, they will not forgive you in a hurry. Right. One more thing, if I just carry on just that discussion a little bit more in terms of um, getting the right message in that suits individuals. Uh, I think also get in the... <laughs> <laughs> getting the right messaging, uh, sorry, the right controls to suit individuals as well. Um, I think we can very easily fall into the trap of defining a, a single security control configuration for the enterprise full stop. Whereas actually, again, consider that you've got different individuals doing a different, different set of roles that require different levels of access. And maybe, you know, think about the, the configuration that you have within all of your security tools. How can you maybe dial up or dial down some of those security configurations to provide greater protection for some than others and kind of balance that protection versus uh, ability to then get on and, and, and do the job? So I'm really sorry, I read the one colour and it completely threw me. <laughs> I, I did see that oh, one, yeah. That was, that was, uh, well done. Oh, sorry. <laughs> did anyone go? Did anyone actually go to the what? Anyone in this room or know anyone? No. I've been following that story. I'm, I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I miss heard Wonka. <laughs> Let's not worry about details. Right, um, any, any other questions from the floor? At all, at all. Yes, James. Uh, yeah, Catherine, you talked about James Reason's book, and, and from what I remember, that book was mainly about system failure, where system uh, complex systems line up to create a failure. So it's a combination of the human as well as the system. Yes. And I think the challenge with the rapid evolving things, there's not time to map that human footprint. 
uh, there's a book by Kerwin and Ainsworth called Task Analysis, where they actually map the human print, human footprint in systems. I think we need to try and get back to some of that. But the, the, the question is, how do you do that in the time pressure environment that we're all under? It's, it's a really good question, it's, it's how do you frame it? And I think it's, what's the requisite model is always the way I look at this. Um, so what's the minimum, minimum rather level of detail you can get away with for something to be useful? And it is a difficult problem. Um, I think there's an element of trial and error to that. It's a case of looking at the resources that are available and understanding what would scale. Um, you know, I think everyone would love to be able to do hierarchical task analysis on every everything that's out there. We know we can't do that, particularly when we're working for a large company. So maybe it picks up on what Andy was just saying, you know, where are your key risk points? Where are the points where actually adopting that level of rigor is appropriate, given the risk that they convey, and applying that sort of methodology there? Um, but like I said, I mean, I, I think there's lots we can draw upon. I think we can demystify it. That doesn't mean it's an easy problem to solve, but I think it's a tractable problem. It just means using the sorts of resources that you've just mentioned there in an intelligent way and working in a multidisciplinary way. And I think we can get really far forward if we do that. Can I bring up something with, with you, Andy? You said, you know, don't say, don't say no, don't say no, don't say no. Um, I, I mean, I used to be a trainer years ago for BBC, and one of the things I used to tell people was, the most important word you'll ever learn is no. Um, because as, when you come in and you're green and you're fresh and you want to show you're enthusiastic and you want to be helpful and you want to be seen to be the, you know, the person to come to, there is a real bad tendency to say yes when really sen the sensible thing to do is to say no. So how do you get them to that stage so they know the difference? Of course, you need to say no to the things that are unacceptably dangerous, right? Um, how do they not... know what's unacceptably dangerous until they've actually cocked it up in the first place? Okay, so, so this is where, I, I, I don't think it's a case of um, you know, folks in the business saying no, it's I guess us, us in security um, deciding or making a recommendation, you know, can you do this thing, can you not do this thing? Uh, and at the end of the day, it comes down to, to risk management, right? And, and that's one of the great things that we as humans, we as cybersecurity professionals can bring to the party. Uh, we have experience, we can look at um, previous incidents that have happened, we can look at threats uh, to understand, okay, what's the, again, classic risk, risk management stuff, what's the likelihood of the bad thing happening, what's the impact if it does, or oh, here's some things that you could maybe do to mitigate that. Um, with the, the drive to, to try and enable as much as possible. Uh, because the danger of saying no all the time is that, well, I'm just not going to bother asking you anymore. I'm just going to go do the thing. That's where we get shadow IT from, right? And that's even more dangerous because, again, we in cybersecurity, we can't protect what we don't know about. So if a team has gone off and they've set up their own cloud subscription or you know, running their own services or this or that because cybersecurity kept saying no, then, well, that's, that's going to be an even bigger headache for us. Excellent. Anything else from the floor? Right at the very, very back, please. I think this will probably be the last question. Hi there, this question's for Dave. Dave, you touched on a point in your talk about business continuity and disaster recovery. One of the challenges we have in our organisation is we have quite a mature sort of fire and flood recovery, so switching from site A to site B, but the business doesn't understand cyber recovery is a totally different ball game, and our RTO would be much, much longer to recover. Have you got any advice or experience in that area? When it comes to test and business continuity, and you, you should, you should be doing that apparently at least once a year. It's terrifying for many businesses, and you're 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 talking to business leaders and asking them to deliberately go and do something that you've no idea if it's going to work the first time, and you have to take that into account. You say, it, it, when it comes to being convincing on on these things, it's the Yes, but if we don't test it, how will we know if it ever works? Uh, and you get a lot of pushback for the, well, I pay you, it should work, it better work, or you're out the door and all, all these sorts of things. But uh, testing your DR scenarios, you can do as 
much tabletop exercising as you like, but somebody has to go and pull the big cable out and see if everything fails across. And the thing is that if you understand what a bad day looks like, you can turn around and say, look, we think we've got business continuity, but until you let us pull that cable out, we will not know 100%. And at that point, you have made an investment in this second data center or second site or whatever, and you do not know whether that investment is working or not. And so if you turn around and say, look, this is a bit way about validating that investment in that business continuity uh, infrastructure, that it is the final test you need to be able to do it. You just have to pick your timing. You do it, you, you demand a maintenance window and say, look, we must be able to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and that's that's all you can do with it. But it is the if you frame it around the this is validating and and it's part of our governance for the business to make sure that our investments have been wisely made, that helps the conversation because they understand validating investments and and doing governance on their own own investments. So at that point, you're like, yeah, but it's still going to be terrifying. I mean, I've I've, I've done many a test or big automated script type thing where you just sit there and go Ooh, and push the button or pull the cable and see what actually happens. Uh, most of the time it works, I'm glad to say. But yeah, it becomes that. But yeah, you have to, if if you do not know whether it's going to work or not, then you do not have business continuity. I think that's been a really interesting session. <clears throat> Can I ask you to thank Kat, Andy, Holly and Dave one more time, please. <laughs>